I'm so sorry. So sorry, I had to finish up a uh, 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 thought. Uh, we got uh, <laughs> there are girls walking out the door. We're, they're walking out. They're like, don't start without us. <laughs> All right. Good to see you here tonight. Amen. And uh, I am just going to thank you for being here. Like you had a choice in the matter. Uh, so you have a decision or anything like that. Love that. Oh, we're going to take our Bibles tonight. We're going to head to the book of Genesis. Uh, we're going to start in the book of Genesis chapter, well, 33. Then we're going to start 33. And I'll get there in just a minute. There's going to be, going to need some participation. Looking forward to that. Now, and you don't have to raise your hand on this, but how many have enjoyed camp so far? Amen. That's great. That's great. Would anybody say not feeling pressured, but would anybody say that you feel like the Lord's kind of led you or spoken to you about it uh, as something in your life? How many would say that? All right. All right. The week is not young, but still plenty of time. So excited about that. I want to talk to you tonight uh, about a subject. Uh, if the message had a title, it's simply this. It's not supposed to. It's not supposed to. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Uh, one of the things that I come across in youth ministry is that so many young people, as you get older, you start figuring out you don't quite fit. Amen. <laughs> Way to own that, Henry. <laughs> know who you are, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, whether it be in your family, you know, we got some somewhat complicated family situations. Sometimes it's maybe in your school, uh, your peer group. And by the way, even in your youth group, sometimes you can feel like, we try not to let it be that way, but you can feel like you don't fit. And we just need to go to the Bible about that. We just need to go to the Bible about that. And we're going to take, take a look. We're going to spend a little time tonight, uh, and we're going to talk about the life of Joseph. Joseph. How many here would say, oh, I, I know about the life of Joseph. Joseph, would you raise your hand? Okay. All right. But uh, Joseph's life spans biblically a good amount of time. And a lot of times we know pieces of his life, but we've never actually stopped and looked at and thought about his life and the things that, that young Joseph went through. I don't know if you realize this. But uh, Joseph did not fit in his family. Right. Joseph did not fit in his family. And sometimes, you know, typically when somebody tells the story of Joseph, and this isn't wrong, this isn't wrong, but they'll start and they'll say, well, you know, Joseph's father loved him more than the other kids and, you know, gave him a coat of many colors. And the Bible says it. There's nothing wrong with that. But I'll tell you this. The story of Joseph doesn't actually start with Joseph, right? It starts with his dad, Jacob. Now, Jacob, you know the story of Esau and Jacob. Jacob's got to head north to Uncle Laban's place. He doesn't, and that's the plan because mom says, well, your brother's going to kill you, and I would like that to not happen. We've already tricked poor dad. And so I'm going to send you north. He goes to Bethel. I'm not going to spend time about that. Finally, he gets to Laban's. He shows up at Uncle Laban's. So, uh, boy, he brings him in. He's so excited to find out that his nephew, Jacob, is there. And uh, while he's there, he says, hey, you should work for me. And Jacob, Jacob lays eyes on his cousin, uh, uh, on Rachel. <laughs> He, he sees Rachel, and boy, now in the time, the culture of the day, uh, you wouldn't just go and say, you know, hey, sir, can I marry your daughter? Sounds good. You would offer a dowry because those, uh, a, a girl was a member of the family. She was a productive helper in the family. You can see why this has died off. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but uh, she's... Why are you defensive about it? You know why they're defensive about it? Okay. So they're sitting there and they come and uh, 
he, he comes to Laban. Now, he doesn't have any money. He doesn't have any money. He doesn't have anything to offer. But this is what he says. Now, listen, this is what he says. He says, I will serve you. Guys, I want you to think about this. I will serve you seven years. I will work full time for you seven years for your daughter, Rachel. I don't know about you, that's got to make Rachel feel pretty good, right? <laughs> well, Rachel's got an older sister, her name's Leah. <laughs> wow, we're laughing. <laughs> it's not her name, poor Leah. She's been getting run through the ringer for many a generation. The Bible says that Leah was tender-eyed. There are so... Baptist preachers have defined this in countless ways. Some guys say, well, she had a lazy eye. Most pastors say she was ugly. You know, whatever. But but Jacob's heart was for Rachel. It wasn't for Leah, you know. And so, uh, you know the story. He works these seven years, and he comes to, to Laban. Uh, I think that translates scumbag. Anyway, uh, he, goes to Laban and he goes to Laban and he says, hey, I've worked for seven years. Give me my wife. And he says, hey, no problem. No problem at all. And so he throws this big feast, this this wedding ceremony. You and I, we enter into an area where customs come into play. and We don't fully understand how this all works. But what we do know is somehow, I'm assuming, I can only assume intoxication was involved in this event. I have to assume that. But I know this much. Jacob wakes up like I don't want to be there, but I kind of want to be there, right? Jacob wakes up and is like, good morning, honey. Ah! So he marches himself to Laban and he's like, what have you done to me? Right. You know, this isn't a misunderstanding for the last seven years of who I was serving you for. And Laban, yeah, some of you were trying to defend him. Laban says, well, you know, we have a custom where we can't let the younger daughter be married before the older daughter. So, you know, I gave you Leah. And he said, hey, don't worry about it. I'll give you Rachel too. Boy, that feels special, isn't it? We're here again in a holy matrimony a couple weeks later after your sister. Uh, who wants to be the sister after, right? No one. I know some of you really love your sisters, but you do not love them that much. And so he said, don't worry about it. Listen, I'll give you Rachel. You can marry her too. But, uh, you know, you have to serve me another seven years. And so what poor right, Leah, she's got to feel really special, right? Right, the unwanted daughter. So here's Jacob serving Laban with his two wives. Right? The <laughs> wife that he has, he has loved so much. The Bible says that those seven years of service for her were just like but a few days in him. And then the prank wife, <laughs> Leah. Wow. Well, after they get married, after they get married, they start building a family. Leah begins to have children first. Predominantly in the beginning, it was sons. Leah has Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. As you read through the scriptures, almost every single time, in my heart, honestly, my heart hurts for poor Leah. Because I just feel like she thought more of men than she should have. That's Brother Dan's opinion here. <laughs> every time she has one of these little baby boys, she says, now my husband will be joining me. Right. Yeah. Now my husband, she just wanted to be loved. That's all she wanted. Poor, poor Leah. I feel so bad for her. Well, Rachel couldn't have any kids. So every time that Leah has one of these, and not just babies, baby boys, right. and in this culture, yeah. right, of heritage and lineage, and that's a big deal. Yeah. And poor Rachel, she can and Rachel even says to, to Jacob, you give me give me child lest I die. And and Jacob gets upset. Right. Now, hey, I'm not the one withholding children from you. You go talk to God. This was a point of contention with them at one junction. So 
Rachel decides, and this is where it starts to get uber weird, if it wasn't enough already. Rachel goes to her handmaid, Bilha, and says, you know what? You go have kids, and I'll raise them. They'll be my kids. So she has Dan and Naphtali. Well, Leah, who had left off, temporary, she thought she had left off having children, but she doesn't want to be outdone by her sister. It had been, it was 4-0. And now she decides, hey, it's two, it's two to four. I'm, you know, Sister Rachel's starting to catch up. So I'm not gonna have that. So she takes her handmaid, Zilpha, and says, hey, you go have some kids. And we get Gad and Asher, right? Some of you look like this is all controversial. This is from Genesis, okay? <laughs> Leah, Leah, now there's, that you've got four from Leah, two Bilha, two Zilpha, and <laughs> Leah goes back un, 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 unintentionally, Leah goes back to having kids. The next baby, and this is Brother Dan's loving nickname that I've given him, uh, Issachar, who I like to call the Mandrake baby. Um, <laughs> you'll laugh if you've read your Bible. <laughs> Leah has, goes back to having children and has two more sons, Issachar and Zebulun. So we are, we are 10 kids into this thing. Rachel still hasn't had one kid. Rachel was the original woman who Jacob loved. God remembers Rachel and opens her womb. And baby Joseph is born. Do you think, do you think that when dad held Rachel's baby Joseph, that there wasn't just a special smile on his face? Do you think that Zilpha and Bilha, do you think their kids felt like they were just treated equally as everybody else in the family was? And some of you actually, because of how you've been raised, you know better. You know better. Now, just in case, just in case, you don't think that there was any favoritism, something happens. Finally, Jacob takes his ever-growing family, leaves Laban, who to me is just a horrible human being, it's as nice as I can say it. He leaves and he's on his way back. One of his servants goes ahead to meet Esau to basically say, hey, hey, hey Jacob's on his way back, and uh, everything's cool, right? <laughs> well, you don't still want to kill him or anything like that. <laughs> that servant shows back up and says, uh, Esau's coming rapidly, and he's got a bunch of men with him. So Jacob... Jacob says, here's what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to put the... Now, they, they all know the lives in danger, right? So he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to divide up the cattle, and we're going we're to send some gifts ahead, and then we're going to divide up the groups. Now, watch this. And, and you have your Bibles in Genesis uh, 33. Look at verses 1 and 2. And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men, and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaidens and he put the handmaidens and their children foremost right. and Leah and her children after and Rachel and Joseph hindermost right. you go what does that mean that means that they saw they felt like that army of 400 men was coming to kill them and Jacob's freaking out and he says okay and unwittingly he puts a priority on his own family. Right. 
I love all my kids the same. He didn't. <laughs> he didn't. He said, okay, uh, Zilpa, Bilha, you take your kids. You go out front. <laughs> and hopefully, while they're killing you, oh. Leah and the other oh. kids will get a chance to escape. But if they don't, that's fine, because I want Rachel and Joseph in the back. <laughs> They have the best chance of escaping. Now listen, you can say, Dad loves me the same. But there's no there's no escaping that. There's no escaping that. It's been made really clear. You don't know what this means. You don't think Reuben remembered that later on? You don't think Simon ever thought about that? You think really they sold Joseph in a bondage just because he had a coat dad gave him? You really think that's all it was? This started, let's listen, family hurts can run the deepest. Because they can run the longest. They were there. Some of them were definitely old enough to know, oh, yeah, there's Rachel and Joseph in the back. The favored baby. They go on, and in Genesis 35, 16 and 18, you find out that Rachel's going to have another baby boy. His name's Benjamin. Rachel dies having Benjamin. Poor Jacob. Jacob, it was God's design, but it wasn't Jacob's design or intention to have this big, messy family. He served for Rachel. And now his Rachel is gone. And I'm not saying he never cared for Leah. We don't fully know. But he's got all these kids, and he has two children. What he has left of Rachel is Joseph and baby Benjamin. That's what he's got. Right. Joseph, number one, Joseph didn't fit in his own family. Joseph had ten brothers who did not like him and didn't like what he represented. This is before we get further. Yeah. This is just, right? I don't know about you, listen, if my mom is Bilha or Zilpha, I'm going to be like, right? I'm not going to feel like somehow, you know, dad loves me like everybody else on these Christmas morning type things. So number one, Joseph didn't fit in his own family. Yeah. Right. Now I want you to look at Genesis 37. Genesis 37. Genesis chapter 37. Now Joseph's getting older. He's getting older and he's developing into who he is as a person. And praise God, he's honest. He's a young person who, yeah, his brothers don't fit. Now listen to me. He doesn't fit with his brothers, his half-brothers, whatever you call them. And his mom's dead. All the other kids, when they fall and scrape their knee, they run to mom. In his own house, he doesn't fit because of mom. And he's got a little brother. I Personally, I felt like he was defensive of it, and we see that in Egypt, in my opinion. And in Genesis 37, too, it says, these are the generations of Jacob, Joseph being 17 years old. He was still a teenager was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Joseph not only didn't want to participate in his brother's sin, but he was honest enough to tell his dad. And listen to me. Joseph not only didn't fit in his family, Joseph did not fit because of his honesty. Joseph didn't fit because of his honesty. There's some of you, whether it's in your school, whether it's amongst your friends, you don't quite fit because of your honesty. Hey, hey man, why you got to make a mess about this? Why you got to say something? Why don't you just be quiet and let's do what we're doing? You don't have to get involved, but you know about it, so just be quiet. Just be quiet. He didn't fit because of his honesty. Verses 3 and 4 of the same chapter says, Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. The Bible just says it plainly. 
because he was the son of his old age. And I think part of that, personally, I believe part of that has to do with Rachel, my opinion. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. And could not speak peaceably unto him. Some of you know what that's like. It's not even that people don't like you. It's that their, their disdain for you just bubbles up at every opportunity. And people can't even speak peaceably about you. Joseph did not fit in his family. He didn't fit because of his honesty. And Joseph didn't fit because of his favor. Joseph didn't fit because of his favor. My, my grandfather, who passed away many years ago, my grandfather served in World War II under General Patton as a tanker. Uh, my grandfather was a pretty stern man. And uh, I remember talking to my mom about my grandfather and uh, her, obviously her dad, and she would say, yeah, you know, Grandpa, he was, he was a pretty stern guy. And I would just tell her, I never noticed, because he liked me. Oh. Oh. Huh. My, of, all, of all my siblings, I don't know why my grandfather favored me. So the only thing I remember from this World War II tanker was he was always kind to of me. Now you talk to the other siblings, <laughs> You get a different report, you know? And even as a young person, you may not realize this, at a young age, God will give you favor. As you follow him, God will give you favor. Right. And they can see that Joseph, by the way, this isn't anything limited to his family. He's going to get favor with Potiphar. Right. He's going to get favor with the jail keeper. He's going to get favor with Pharaoh. Right. It's because, not because he was such a great person, but because God's yeah. hand was upon his young life. You go, man, it doesn't sound like God's with him. It doesn't sound like God's with him. I mean, his childhood is at best a dumpster fire. Right. It is a train wreck. Yeah. Right? He doesn't fit with any of his family, and his poor mom dies having his little brother. Yeah. His, his dad still loves him, but now his brothers hate him for it. And I, no offense, I don't think moms loved him a whole lot either. He didn't fit because of his favor. <laughs> this entire group had some serious daddy issues. I'll tell you what. Genesis 37, would you turn there? Genesis 37. Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to start reading in verse number 5. And Joseph dreamed a dream. And he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Right. I didn't think there was room for more hate in this poor guy's life. You know all your brothers who hate you? Do you know what Joseph did? He just told them the truth. Right. He didn't try it. This wasn't a daydream. He didn't conjure this up. He just told them what had happened to him. And they didn't like it. They hated it. Listen to me. They hated him. For who he was on the inside. Yeah. They just hated him. And he wasn't trying to do anything to them. He wasn't trying to hurt them. Yeah. He just told them what was going on in the inside. You ever tell people what's going on in the inside and they don't understand it and they don't like you because of it? Yeah. See, sometimes you think that you're the only person who's not understood. Yet your Bible tells you about yeah. so many who were right. misunderstood. Yeah. Right. Hey, I'm going to tell them verse 6. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. I don't, I don't believe Joseph's bragging. I think he's saying, Hey, man, you still listen to this. This is crazy. Verse 7, For behold, uh, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheep stood round about and made obeisance to my sheep. And his brethren said to, said to him, Shall we, shall thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou have thou indeed have dominion over us and they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words it's bad enough that dad loved your mom more than us it's bad enough that dad loved you more than us but now you're dreaming these dreams where we're going to worship you you little runt listen listen 
His brothers are grown men. He's 17. His brothers are in their 30s, some of them. Maybe even later. Whoa, 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 whoa. You teenager, I'm not even... I got my own family. You're telling me I'm going to bow down to you? And they didn't take it like, oh, that's a weird dream. The Bible says they hated him yet the more. By the way, not done. Not done. We go on, verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream. And told it his brethren and said, Behold, I I have dreamed a dream more. <laughs> yeah, at some point, I would have been like, I don't care what dream you dream about. It's like, keep it to yourself. Write it in a diary. Right? Do something. Don't be telling these guys. And behold, I dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and, and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him. Right. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brothers envied him. Ah, ah, ah. But his father observed the same. Poor Joseph, listen to me. Poor Joseph wasn't even understood by the dad who loved him. Like the one guy who's on his side rebukes him. goes, What are you dreaming? What are you thinking? What's wrong with you? You don't fit. You don't fit. You don't fit in the family. You don't fit with your honesty. You don't fit with your favor. You don't fit with your thinking and your dreaming and the way you are. You don't fit. You don't fit. That's my introduction. I want to preach my message. Hey, preach. <laughs> Point number one. Stop thinking you're supposed to fit. You're not supposed to fit. I don't know why I don't fit in, because you're not supposed to. God did not make Joseph for family time. God made Joseph for Egypt. Because he did save much people alive. He saved his entire family. All the ingrates. All the haters, all the enviers, he saved their bacon. And he did it because he was willing to not fit. Some of you need to stop exhausting yourself trying to fit everywhere you are and start trying to figure out, hey, who God make me to be. We don't need more followers. We don't need more fitters. We need more people following God. Lord, you made me different. It's on purpose. I want to be the best different I can be. Right. What you need to fit in is God's plan. Yeah. How many young people got derailed from following God because they got sick and tired and fed up of not fitting? Right. For standing out, just for doing what's right. Yeah. Yeah. Just for trying to make good decisions and do right things. And they didn't fit. And they just gave up on it. I'm glad Joseph didn't give up on it. Yeah. Hey, 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 I didn't even talk about slavery. I didn't even get to Potiphar's house. I didn't even talk about prison. We haven't even got there, and this kid's lived a life full of drama. In our day and age, he would be hopped up on so many pharmaceuticals and have, a, have counselors lined up for a week. We would give him every reason to be messed up, but he wasn't messed up. He was right on track. He was right on track. Joseph wasn't supposed to fit. I, I'm tired of our young people growing up in a society trying to convince you you got to fit. You don't have to fit. Right, right, you yeah. need to be following God. That's Good. what you need to do. Right. God's got yeah. Your life is on purpose. It's not an accident. Yeah. Brother Dave, you don't know how messed up my home is. Yeah, well, I, I know how messed up his home was. Yeah. I know how messed up his home was. Well, and God did amazing things with his life. Are you going to let God fulfill the purpose he has for your life or are you going to bail early on him you want somebody to be upset at God boy Joseph fits the bill I think anybody could be like I'm out I'm out I don't need this I didn't do anything wrong do you realize the majority of Joseph's life was full of him being punished for things he never did wrong his brothers were mad at him his dad's mad at him they sell him into slavery Potiphar's skank wife tries to seduce him. He rejects her. So she lies about him. So they throw him in prison. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. By the way, this is just Brother Dan's opinion. This is Brother Dan's opinion. I'm going to totally specify this. I believe personally, I won't get into all of it. I believe personally, God revealed through circumstance to Potiphar that it was his wife and not Joseph right. later in the years. Yeah. I believe that. That's my opinion. You believe what you want, and you can get to heaven and find out Brother Dan was right. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, he, he didn't do anything wrong. They throw him into prison. But God's favor is not subject to circumstances. And so God's favor was still with him. So the warden puts him in charge of everybody else. He meets the butler and baker. What happens? They forget him. Well, one is dead, so he can't remember him. But the, uh, the, but, the butler, he forgets him. I want to be a Joseph. I want to see God do amazing things in my life. I want God to, to help me to change the lives of thousands and thousands of people. Are you sure about that? Whoa. Because you got to be willing not yeah. to fit. Good. Uh, good. Yeah. Some of you are willing to follow Christ as long as you fit with other people. Oh, no. yep. right. You willing to not fit a little bit? Point number two, just in case you didn't like point number one. <laughs> it's not supposed to always be easy. Now, you may be in Alaska, but you're still a part of the United States. And we have a culture of it's supposed to be easy. Why go to camp? I carry a Bible. I do all these things God wants me to do. My life should at least be somewhat easy. Says who? Joseph's life wasn't easy. Daniel's life wasn't easy. David's life wasn't easy. You start going through the Bible and look at some of our heroes, you know what you're going to figure out? That wasn't an easy life. Yet in our powder puff culture, we tell ourselves, hey, if my life's not easy, I must be doing something wrong. <laughs> Joseph's life was miserable because he was doing it right. Yep, that's right. Right. Sure. I don't celebrate your suffering any more than I celebrate my own, but listen to me. Stop telling yourself it's supposed to be easy. Sometimes it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's not. Right? The potter's wheel gets a little rough. The refiner's fire gets a little hot. Yeah. It's because God's doing a great work. You going to give it to him or just try to work it out yourself? It's not supposed to be easy. You're not supposed to fit. Yeah. Number three, it's not supposed to always make sense. Joseph's life is the biggest series of calamities you've ever seen. Yeah. Right? He did it right, and yet was continually punished like he had done something wrong. We don't know her name, but Potiphar's wife is there, and, and all of a sudden, Joseph's being punished. It doesn't make any sense. He does right, gets punished like he's doing wrong. And, 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 and it doesn't seem like he's getting closer to some kind of plan for God has his life. It just seems like it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Oh, you thought it was bad at the house? When did you get sold into slavery? I don't know if you remember this or not, but when his brothers finally show up and, and they realize something bad's happening, they didn't figure out of Joseph yet, but they realize something bad's happening, and what do they say? Hey, we should have listened to the cries of our brother when he was in the pit, when he was begging for his life, and we just ignored him. You think that was bad? When you, you can watch as you're in a cage or you're being drunk along in chains, you can see your homeland and everything you know and your family fading into the distance as you're going into a whole new world that likely is a nightmare. Right. Yeah. He gets to Potiphar's house. Man, finally a little bit of reprieve. Potter's, Potiphar's smart enough to figure out God's hands on this guy. He was taken. God's hands on this guy. Wow. Joseph says, plainly, Potiphar has put me in charge of everything. He doesn't even know what he owns. He's trusting me to that level. Yep. He doesn't even know what he owns. He just knows Joseph knows, and that's good enough for me. Good. And Potiphar's wife, who was way too bored, <laughs> she got tired of the soap operas or whatever, and decides to go mess with Joseph. And all of a sudden, what seemed like finally we're getting some traction. Yeah, come on. Finally, I got into a home where I feel like 
some parents, you can kind of start working some stuff out, then back into the system. Finally got to a school where I could start to kind of meet some people and it's not to back out. New place. My life just a big calamity. Hey, it's not supposed to make sense to you right now. It's not supposed to make sense. Stop telling yourself that. What it's supposed to do is just be according to God's plan. You want God to do something big, then you have to trust him in a big way. Say, Lord... I don't know how all this works, but I know you're working it all together, and that's good enough for me. Good. It's not supposed to make sense. Genesis chapter number 40. <laughs> I love this story. I love the whole thing. I've read this story so many times. Joseph's, Joseph's working in the dungeon. The warden has decided to put him in charge of everything. He's like Potiphar. He figured out, well, God's hands on this guy. And I, honestly, I know he's not a great person, but I kind of like the warden. He's like, yo, Joseph takes care of everything. I'm just going to sit here. <laughs> right? Yeah. You may think he was a man of wonderful character, but I think he was looking for somebody for, looking for a break. Joseph, you two go take care of everybody. I'll be by the vending machine. Yeah. I'll be like by the coffee pot. That's where it goes. Right. Oh, by the way, don't escape. Right. He trusted Joseph. Joseph's going around checking on the other prisoners. So obviously he can't be chained to a wall. He comes in. There's the butler and the baker. They both had these disturbing dreams. Hey, who knows about dreams? This is what I love. I love it when you get to the place in your life that the weird stuff from your childhood and teen years starts to make some sense. Yeah. <laughs> Do you honestly think that all of this insanity that lives inside my head just made sense all my life? Then one day God let me start preaching to teenagers. And I went, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Okay, Lord. Okay. I wasn't supposed to. I wasn't supposed to make sense. That wasn't my purpose. That wasn't my purpose. You know, drain yourself trying to fit in with people yep. who will never accept you as the same because they don't know who they are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. He goes into the bank. And I love I love Joseph because here he is in a dungeon. His life is just pouring. As far as results, not as far as the spirit of God, because he had peace through God is what he had. He comes in, and here's the poor butler and the baker. What does he have? Compassion. He comes into the cell. Hey, your countenance has fallen. What's going on, guys? Uh, we both had these dreams. Well, tell me. God is the one who interprets dreams. Tell me about your dreams. Well, you know, uh, I took the king as kind of the business and this and this. Oh, okay. What about I, I had the, I'm the baker, and I had the bread, and these birds came. I kind of love how he tells it. He tells the butler, he says, hey, well, uh, he knew the interpretation. God was with him. By the way, now listen, please hear me. Joseph didn't go get God when he needed him in that moment. Oh, He'd been walking with him for years. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Some of you are telling yourselves that when I need him, I'll run and get God. You won't even recognize his voice. Right. Right. Yeah. What's the interpretation? Oh, man. Hey, in three days' time, the king's going to lift you up. He's going to restore your position. <laughs> I can see the butler like, yeah. man, I hope this guy's right. The, the baker's like, oh, dude, that's awesome. Hey, hey, Joseph, what about me? What about me? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, that's easy. Three days time. The head, I think he says that the king's going to lift your head off your shoulders. I think it's something like that. I don't think the baker's countenance approved much. And Joseph almost feels excited to tell him because he can interpret the dream. Hey, I know what that is. Why are you smiling? Three days time. And what does Joseph say to the, the butler? Now listen, when you go to the king, listen, you know, you know we've been together right in here. My life, a bunch of people lying about me and all this other stuff, but you're going to the king. Put in the good word for me. Good, yeah. You'll see the king every day. Put in the good word for me. Hey, Joseph, I'm not going to forget you, bro. You interpreted my dream. Thank you, brother. I'm not going to forget you. Don't we say stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. Until he forgot him. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? Two years later. Wow. 
it's not supposed to happen immediately. It's not supposed to happen immediately. I just feel like God wants me to go do this. It's not supposed to happen right this second. I want to give you something to ponder here. When did God begin making David king? When he was anointed king in Judah, in Hebron by Judah, or seven years later when he was anointed king in Hebron by Israel as well as Judah? Or was it many years prior when the prophet Samuel came and anointed him with the oil? I believe that the second Samuel poured that, poured that anointing oil on David's head, God began, began in that second to prepare him to become the king. There was not a wasted minute. There was not a wasted second. There was not a wasted day. God wasn't working in his life. He said, I feel like God wants something with my life. Yes, and he's working on you every single day. I'm sorry you end up in the cave of Abdullam sometimes. I'm sorry you end up in Potiphar's house in these different places. But young people, listen, don't get this world's thinking in your head of it's supposed to. Yeah. My parents are supposed to be better parents than that. My siblings should understand me better. Someone should care about me. Other teenagers should talk about me. Amen. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we get this thinking in our head. Well, it's supposed to. Well, it's supposed to. I'm just letting it sink in. Maybe, just maybe, you're not supposed to fail. Do you feel the weight kind of lift when you realize that? I don't have to fix that. I'm not trying. To, I'm not trying to be one of the standouts. You know what I'm talking about? Like the standout, like I need attention. I'm not talking about that. Then you just don't fit. You don't fit in your family. You don't fit because of God's favor. You don't fit because of your future. You don't fit because of these things. Let me tell you something. It's okay. It's okay. You don't have to look a certain way, talk a certain way. You just need to be the best you that God has created you to be. And one day if you keep following him... One day, you will not only fit, it'll make sense. Time will come. I can't even imagine what Joseph was thinking when his brothers rolled into town. <laughs> and he was so kind. And the Spirit of God was upon this man. And I'm telling you, new one of my brother Dan, I'm like, <laughs> welcome, boys. <laughs> Your worst nightmare has just begun. <laughs> I also want to point something. This isn't the message, but I'll point something out. The brothers, no matter how much forgiveness he gave them, they could never escape their own guilty conscience. You think you're getting away with it. You fail to realize you can't get away from your own conscience. It'll haunt you for the rest of your life. Those brothers never had peace. They never had peace. Even when they were being blessed, every time they saw Joseph, he was a living reminder of what they had done. Yeah. But Joseph lived free of that. He lived with a clean conscience before God and man. He didn't have to deal with that. And in that hour, and as he went along, Joseph tried to tell him. He pled with him. Hey, listen, don't hate yourselves. Don't, don't, don't put this on yourselves. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. To save much people alive. That's what God can do with a life that doesn't fit. That's what God can do with a life that doesn't even make any sense. All messed up. God did an amazing, amazing work through this man's life. And I, I got a second, so I got to visit it too. It's just such an incredible journey. 
they come in, you know, the brothers roll into town, and um, Joseph says they, they talk about the younger brother. Boy, man, poor, poor Joseph. He had one living uh, sibling on the planet. It was, it was his younger brother, Benjamin. And he heard about him. He said, go get him. Go get him. And he said, you're spies. We're not spies. Yes, you are. You're spies. You come to spy out the nakedness of the land. And no, no, we're not. And he kept a brother. Remember that? He kept Simeon. He said, I'm going to keep one of the brothers, put him in prison. And I'm going to keep him here because he wanted to make sure that they come back. But I love this. So he heads back home. They head back home. And they tell dad, hey, there's a hard man down in Egypt. <laughs> There's a hard man down in Egypt. He spoke hard words to us. We got to take Benjamin and we got to go back. He's got Simeon. He's got Simeon. We got to get Benjamin and we got to go back. What dad say? Now I've lost two sons. <laughs> <laughs> Simeon's in prison. Now oh, I've lost two sons. <laughs> dad did not send them back to get him. He just scratched him off the wall. <laughs> if you read the Bible and it says, he said, we'll all starve to death if we don't go back. It was the famine, not Simeon. Yeah. I'm sure Simeon was like, well, let's see, it took this many days to get here, so to get home, it'll take this many days to get back, so I'll probably be in here for this long. You know, that day came and went. It's like, Taking them a little bit longer. <laughs> They're busy eating. <laughs> Dad's like, oh, lost a couple kids. Oh well, let's get Benjamin. You know? I'm still alive. <laughs> you know. The family, the family Joseph wanted, he got it. The love he wanted to feel, he got it. The fulfillment, the purpose. Joseph got it all, but he got it in God's timing, according to God's will. You willing to wait? You willing to wait? Or you got to go on the internet and find a boyfriend that way? Come on. You going to wait till God grows you and matures you and gives you a wife, or are you just going to go on the internet and get it that way? Are you going to get bitter and harder and bottle it up even more about your family? Or are you going to give it to God? If I got up and I gave you my testimony, I wouldn't shake you. Because some of you have had a harder life than I've had in my youth. That's why I brought you to Joseph. I don't care how messed up you've had, you may have this. Yeah. Your family's never been at a point where dad said, listen, take these brothers and you put them out there. You take these brothers and you put them here and then you take this kid and put them back here. You never lived through that. You may have siblings who hate you, but man, they don't hate you like that. I brought you to a biblical life that made no sense. And yet the truth is we tell this story with glamour and applause and celebration wow. and we step over the years and decades of suffering right. that this poor boy went through yeah. without his mom yeah. but he trusted God and God said I can use that why do we think we have to be something before God can use us God can use us because God is someone Amen. Stop thinking you got to build up your resume before God can use you. God just waiting for somebody to trust him. Amen. Say, Lord, my life is an absolute train wreck. But I'm going to give it to you. And you can help it make sense. Say, Brother Dan, I've, met, I, I've already talked to some young people here at camp. You're going through a bunch, and yet you're helping other people who are also going through a bunch. You already know it's true. You're already taking your difficult life and ministering to other people. Joseph was in prison ministering to two people who had bad dreams. I'm not trying to compare myself with everybody, but man, that's just what it makes me. 
Oh, you're on nightmares. I'm in prison. Falsely accused after my brother sold me into slavery. I don't want to hear your drama. <laughs> Joseph still cared about other people. You know, it's funny. When you suffer, you're a lot more sensitive to other people's suffering, aren't you? And I just want to throw back to today. And I'm so thankful you followed up on that. Let it stop with you. Let it stop with you. So God, I give you my life. If you you'll do something with it, I'll just keep trusting you. Whether I'm in the field with my brothers, I'm in Potiphar's house, or I'm in the dungeon. One day he'll show up to show up in the palace. Who can God trust in the palace? People like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Joseph, David, people who, people who trusted him when they didn't fit. It didn't make sense. The change that they desired didn't come immediately. It took time. When they wished it would have been easy, it was hard. But they gave it to God, and God used their lives. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Young people, I don't know every aspect of your life. I don't. But God does. God does. And God has a purpose for you. The question is not, can God? That's not the question. The question is, will you? Will you? That's the question. And I don't know where you're at tonight, but I hope that you just turn to God in your heart. Just like we talked about this afternoon, start giving it to God. You bottling it up inside is not giving it to God. You're just creating a bomb that will explode at a later date. That's all that's happening. Will you give it to God? Say, God, my life, I don't have to fit. Some of you, I would just, I hope tonight, I hope tonight some of you will pray. Say, God, I don't have to fit. I'm going to stop trying to fit. I'm just going to turn my attention. I'm going to turn my energy to just following you. That's what I need to do. That's what I need to do. God, you know my heart. You know I'm not trying to, to, to be all these things that I'm accused of. God, I'm just going to trust you and follow you. I'm just going to trust you and follow you. Maybe there's a young person here tonight. You feel like, man, God, I, feel, I just feel like God wants me in the ministry. But I just, I don't know, I don't know how to get there. God's probably already begun the work. You just don't even realize it. You don't even realize he's already doing the work. He's already preparing you. The home you have, the friends you have, the streets you live on, the church you go to is all part of God's plan for your life. It's not can God, it's will you. Will you. Will you trust him tonight? Will you trust him tonight? I know earlier we had an opportunity for an invitation and... I'm not, I'm not trying to delay things or anything like that, but I always want to give young people an opportunity to take a desire and turn it into a decision. And if there's a young person tonight, you feel like, I just want to go, I just want to sit before the Lord, pray, and, and ask God to help me with some things, help me to let some things go, and help me to give some things to Him, and start to trust Him more, and realize my life's on purpose. I want to open the altar to you so that you can come and just spend some time with the Lord. Say, Lord, help me. Help my life to make some sense. And Lord, I just trust you with whatever you have, wherever you go. We need to let some people out. So let's all stand together. And as we stand together, the altars are open.